station. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It will be available on our YouTube station in a couple of days. If you happen to peruse our YouTube station, please subscribe because we're trying to boost our membership there. So thank you. So I want to welcome you, old friends and new friends, um, our Zoom attendees. I want to say to the Zoom people that if you have questions of the artists, please um, write it in the chat and Mark will take good care of you. So the Peg Center is so pleased to offer a dream of a common language. We welcome its art and its artists as our final exhibition of a very busy first year for us. As a nonprofit, your support as both amplifier and donor is crucial to our continued ability to offer art exhibitions, educational programs, artist conversations, opportunities for engagement, activism, and community service. It fulfills our mission to address social justice through art and activism. If you are interested in being a PEG Center supporter, please go to our website, thepegcenter.org, or simply write a check, and we thank you. So I wanted to actually take a minute and give you a bit of context about Dream of a Common Language, because it means a great deal to me, and it goes deep into my past. In the 1970s, I published a feminist literary and visual art magazine called Maynard Magazine. Maynard were the goddesses who took care of Dionysus, and they were wild and crazy women who did a lot of good, and they slapped a lot of bad behavior down, which is why I picked that. But in Maynard Magazine, we had the writer Marge Piercy, Ms. Magazine co-founder Robin Morgan, radical feminist writer Andrea Dworkin, and poet Adrian Rich as contributors. Rich's book, Dream of a Common Language, was published in 1976. According to Wikipedia, Dream explores the concept of a common language achieved through poetry, art, and feminist ideas. It not only stayed in my heart as both a desire and a bomb, but became a modern day mantra for me, for the Peg Center, and for the huddle. No matter what, we could seek common ground, no matter how sheltered or privileged a life we had created or been born into, we could break out of those limited beliefs in order to find common ground with all humans. All these years later, that dream found a place in my world and through my lens. I'm deeply grateful to Adrian Rich and to all of our feminist mothers, grandmothers, and ancestors who courageously explored women's roles, autonomy, and lives. We stand on their shoulders today. In a quote from Rich's book, she writes, in a world where language and naming are power, silence is oppression and violence. No person trying to take responsibility for his or her identity should have to be so alone. There must be those among us where we can sit down and weep and still be counted as warriors. And so the cacophony of voices protesting for freedom and liberty, in those voices we are united. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. Dream of a Common Language explores the stories and invites the inquiry of diverse female voices who strive for a better world by holding up a mirror to society, race, culture, the environment and the challenges that we face. And so tonight we have the privilege of hearing from three artists. There are four in the show. One is out in Chicago and <clears throat> she will do a short video and that will be up on the Peg Center as well. And Lynn Allen was supposed to be first, but she's stuck in traffic. So let's start with Virginia. I first met Virginia. So Virginia is the collars, the vests and the vessels. I, fir I first met Virginia through her work more than two years ago at the Bromfield Gallery in Sowa. She had won a solo show there in January 2022, and I just happened upon it. It was like, oh my God, I found myself. Her methods and mediums and message slayed me and <clears throat> then, and I filed her catalog away. 
When exploring artists for dream, Virginia's work was an obvious choice to me. She is a mixed media artist making work that doesn't easily follow, fall into a neat category. Her vests are part of a series of non-wearable vest forms, objects inspired by work uniforms that address obstacles and challenges. Her collars also on display comment on women's experience of constriction and freedom. Her mixed media sculpture references the body reflecting upon sensation and reaction. Her objects play with language, ambiguity, using text as a device to clarify or confound, to captivate with stories that are personal and yet communal. I'm really, really looking forward to hearing your words tonight. So welcome, please, Virginia Mahoney. Thank you so much, Paula, and um, thank you again for including my, I know, <laughs> it's got my cards in it, so I don't want to lose it, um, but thank you so much uh, for including me in this show. I, I'm thrilled to be here, um, and I'm still trying to decide if I'm going to read or if I'm going to just talk, so I probably am going to do just a little bit of both, but um, so the work in this show is from four different series. Um, starting in 2005. Am I not close enough? Should I be closer? Okay. Um, the vessels, the ceramic vessels with the cloth doilies uh, are from 2005. Um, the uh, vests are from 2018 and 2019. And the collars are from 2019. And the dickies are from 2020. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through the works and the forms and just talk a little bit about what they all mean to me and hopefully um, you'll add your comments after or questions. Um, so it all started with a personal activism, um, me being originally a ceramic artist and actually a utilitarian potter. Um, and I knew pottery, I knew pottery forms. And so I, when I began to make more um, sculptural pieces, I gravitated towards the vessel namely pictures and these kylix forms, which you see here, these are based on, there's that one and the one over there, and they're based on a Greek form that is a, actually a wine cup. And um, if you've been to the MFA and to the, to the Greek uh, section of the MFA, you, you'll see, uh, you will have seen kylix forms. Um, they don't look like mine, but um, they are, um, I use the utilitarian form for a reason, and that is that it's utilitarian, and it's a metaphor for um, me and my body, or you and your body, or you know, in terms of what it does. And in this case, it it contains, it offers, and it serves. Okay, so think about those things in reference to these forms. Um, but I take them away from the Greek tradition and into um, contemporary thinking about uh, feminist ideas and women's roles, society's expectations of uh, what women should do uh, with themselves and their bodies, et cetera. And so uh, all of that, when I was making those, those uh, pieces, uh, and there's several in the series. If you go on my website, um, you can see more. But when I was making those pieces and carving those forms, those figures into them, um, I'm not sure I knew that I was doing a kind of a self-portrait thing, but I think that's where I was coming from. It was very personal. But it was also uh, me speaking out about these ideas of um, service or servitude, I should say, and um, and what you're constricted or what we have been constricted to do as women in terms of, you know, the limitations. Um, and in the middle of all that, I was um, teaching high school full time, um, making work and raising two kids, one of which was a, a preteen to teen daughter. So um, I was really thinking a lot about, okay, <laughs> You know, what does this all mean? And how is this, how, how do I raise this person to, to be strong and independent? Although she already was because her first steps were away from me. So I knew I had lost it <laughs> from that point on. So 
Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I should have known, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, that that's sort of what was going through my head when I was making that work. Um, uh, fast forward a little bit to um, a few years later, and I began to explore something that wasn't necessarily a vessel, but um, that would refer to the body. And of course, the body is, I guess, a vessel. Sometimes we think about the body as a vessel. Um, but I began to, um, I was looking at, at um, uniforms and, and, um, and sort of, you know, like the Walmart vest and things like that, the tunic rather, the Walmart tunic people wear, or the 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 even the vests that um the tactical vests that um first responders wear, um, those kinds of things. And I was interested in those designs um, because at the time I was uh, kind of struggling with a transition from making big ceramic pieces, because I had been making big, big ceramic pieces, uh, vessels and um, sort of struggling with the transition into not necessarily wanting to make ceramics anymore or you know things like that and wanting to employ my skills as a, as a stitcher and a sewer. Um, I learned to stitch way before I learned to make pottery. And uh, my mother taught me when I was probably five or six, she was a really expert seamstress. She could make anything. And when I was a young teenager, she would make me any outfit I wanted. It was amazing. So I was very fortunate that way. Anyway, um, so I felt like I wanted to, to get involved in those kinds of things. And, um, and so I began to look at clothing as a kind of um, signifier for a lot of things that, um, you know, that we do and that uh, we are. Um, as women, we tend to be identified by our clothing often, and uh, we tend to, um, you know, be sometimes restricted by our clothing, you know, I mean, you, you want to wear that nice dress to the wedding, you got to put those spanks on, you know, and it's so, you know what I mean? It's like, we, we do, we do all these things to kind of, um, to, uh, to make ourselves fit into some kind of ideal. Um, and that goes back to, if you think about some of the, the two themes of these Tylex forms, um, definitely about that. But um, I began to, to look at vests and tunics and work, work uniforms and things like that. And um, I was also struggling with my, my own work as an artist, kind of going through one of those artistic transitions and not knowing what to do. And so I just began to do something what I know, and that is um, to sew and to kind of try to include uh, more, more ideas and more um, more things, more media with my work. And so these vests began to take shape. And um, the ceramic tags on the vests um, have words on them that refer to the, um, the sort of the idea of that particular vest. So the one called restraint over there is it's, it's dark and black and, you know, and it's, it's in the front window there. And, um, and all, all the words on it have to do with ways that we kind of restrict ourselves and restrain ourselves and kind of try to mold ourselves into something we think we should be, but we may not be. Um, and, and all of these garment forms really relate to that idea, the kind of, the way that we tend to um, uh, mask ourselves, separate ourselves, try to make ourselves into something that we think people want us to be. And having been raised in the South with kind of Southern Belle roots, I know a lot about that, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, anyway, so, so these, these vest forms are essentially dealing with ideas of, um, of, like I said, kind of feelings that you have, things that you do that make this that separate you from others and and whether or not um you know whether or not they are painful things that happen or things that you um you know that you just kind of separate yourself in terms of um you know what you say or how you dress or what you do 
that's what those ve those vests are about. Um, the the red one is is uh, it's called blush, and it's really all about what happens when you get embarrassed, you know, and how you get so embarrassed and you just can't stop thinking about that terrible thing that you said. Sort of the way I'm probably going to feel after tomorrow. But anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, and I think I should have turned the page a little while ago. But anyway, um, so. So anyway, the transition to the to from the from the um, pots to the the garment-like forms eventually took place, and um, and the the use of text came about because I'm kind of I've always been very fascinated with language and its ambiguity and how you can say use one word and in, in two or three different ways and it all and it means something different every time and so. Um, I just was really fascinated by that, and I'm so fascinated now that I have lists of words in my studio everywhere, and everything I do now is is related to words, and so I I kind of started this thing with the tags and the words, and then I, um, you know, now I'm kind of, I'm under the spell, so to speak, so um, anyway, moving from vests, uh, which in a lot of ways really were signifying that, that like I said, those barriers and, and how to overcome them and, and how to, you know, how to kind of analyze them and look at them and, and decide what, what's good and what isn't. Um, I decided that I wanted to try other forms and so I got into collars. And, um, you know, the thing about collars is, you know, you think when you say, uh, for instance, you know, priests wear collars, right? But collars have also been used as a form of restriction in terms of, um, you know, in imprisonment and enslavement, okay? And they're also often, you know, in, in women's fashion, they're a very restrictive kind of, uh, you know, and can be very stiff and, and constricting. And so, they can adorn or they can restrict or they can identify, you know, those those different things. And so, um, you know, in a way, the the collars and these particular ones, they are they're all um, a kind of the theme, um, the themes that are addressed in those um, are one of them's called ladylike, one of them's called fool's gold. Uh, the purple one is is called the gaze, and then the one on the left is called um, oh, I'm forgetting. Uh, it's called um, I can't remember the name of it. That's terrible. Anyway, um, charade, fake news. That's right. Yeah, that was an that was actually the first caller I made, and um, you can guess when I made it because anyway. There's a lot of gold on it, and you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so there's that, and then um, you know the other one, fool's gold, is is kind of a, a um, it's about how we kind of go for something that's shiny and pretty, and yet um, it can turn out to be not so nice, and hence the you know the spikes that are all pointing inward. Every one of these has that kind of duality of yes it's pretty on the outside but there are there are ramifications to this prettiness you know so um in any case uh finally i just want to talk about the dickies and um you know a dicky is a thing you may you may or may not know this but it's a um it originated in the mid 1800s for men who couldn't afford a full nice white shirt so they would Get these fake fronts, you know, they called them false fronts, and um, and then they actually became uh, an element in women's fashion a little later later on. But it's essentially a false impression, and um, and so I was really interested in that idea of the false impression, and and also how um, oftentimes again we kind of remake ourselves, we make ourselves over to to create a kind of important false impression 
um, especially on social media. It happens all the time. You see it um, everywhere. And yet again, you know, why are there these spikes there? Because that comes back to bite you. Um, and the, the various themes that have to do with, um, you know, uh, people pleaser or um, being window dressing or wearing armor. Uh, these are all, again, the shields, the protection, the barrier that we put between ourselves and others. Um, and so I continue to use my handiwork in the tradition of countless women before me to present and question these narratives and expose truth, human struggle, and the unruly societal constraints and expectations as a call to action for those who experience my art. So. So we're, oh, hi, Lynn, wonderful. We're gonna listen to everybody and then wrap the chairs up and then you can talk to the artists individually. So, you know what? I think I might um, take a moment here to tell you about Amea Marie Akamoto who can't be with us, she's in Chicago. <clears throat> Terry Rooney, here we go. Because she's pretty extraordinary. So these are digital prints on archival paper. Um, she is 22 years old. She's out in Chicago right now at the Art Institute. She's an activist from Portland, Oregon. She, she deconstructs social injustice and biased behavior through art. And she's got foundations going. She's really, she's a go-getter. Her work has been honored by the National Young Arts Foundation, the U.S. Presidential Scholars Program, the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards, and featured in the Portland Art Museum, Williamson Night Gallery, and U.S. Department of Education. So she's currently a student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She has a passion for social justice. Her website is extraordinary. I would really recommend checking her out. <clears throat> and as I said, we'll have a short five minute video of her up on our Peg Center site soon. Virginia would, I mean, sorry, Lynn, would you like a moment? Because Terry can go before you. Are you ready to dive in? <laughs> want, a, want, a glass, want a glass of wine? Okay, yeah, we'll manage that. Yes, oh, I'm so sorry. So Beth will get you a glass of wine and I'm gonna introduce Terry Rooney. <laughs> Lynn's on her way to Japan tomorrow. So thank you so much for coming, thank you. So I'm gonna introduce Terry Rooney. Terry exhibited here at the Peg Center during our Wear Orange Artists Unite Against Gun Violence show that we had in June. Her broken mirror sculpture reflected her experience as a victim of gun violence and her other sculptures created during the pandemic use the concept of home to comment on the pandemic and on social justice. Terry was born in New York City in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty and it has become an artistic inspiration to her for her whole life. Vanishing Liberty is a series that addresses democracy and freedom. She holds an associate degree in art and illustration from the Fashion Institute of Technology and a Bachelor of Art degree from SUNY Empire State College. Her artwork is in galleries and museums nationally and internationally, including the Brooklyn Museum, Berkshire Museum, and San Francisco Center of the Book. In addition to her own work as painter and printmaker, Rooney is an active independent curator. As a longtime chair of the Amherst Public Art Commission, she created and produced the 2010 and 2012 Am Amherst Biennial exhibitions, which included installations of five at five museums, three colleges, and 20 sites around Amherst. I was very intrigued by her work because it's bold, it's kind of rough, and the glass mirror house was extraordinary with a gun barrel sticking out of it. I love women who speak boldly, who act boldly, who art boldly. And I think Terry, you're one of them. So please welcome Terry Rooney. I'm a better painter than I'm a speaker. <laughs> but, um, okay. 
Hello. Okay. Thank you, Paula, for inviting me back to be in this really special exhibit. Um, I've always wanted to be an artist as long as I can remember. My grandmother went to Cooper Union to study art in New York, but put it aside to raise four daughters. But the influence of music and art surrounded me and my sisters, and I picked up the torch from my grandmother and have been an artist ever since. I had a roundabout route to becoming an artist. At first, I started at Fashion Illustrator, graduating from FIT, which gave me a strong background of drawing the figure. Later, through a high school friend, I discovered the Art Student League. And as soon as I walked into the league, I could smell turpentine and oil paint, and I was hooked. But of course, nowadays, I'm not so hooked because it's more toxic than other mediums. Um, I studied with some great teachers who introduced me to abstract expressionism and the world of color. After I exhausted my resources there, I continued uh, my uh, studies with an independent study program through SUNY, where I had a studio in Westbeth in the village, and I apprenticed prominent artists in the city. I was fortunate to work with Marcia Tucker, the founder of the New Museum. In fact, she pulled me into the office one day when I was a student to help her curate a show. And I love doing it ever since. I also apprentice uh, Jack Torkoff and Elizabeth Murray. And um, I think you probably can see Elizabeth Murray's influence to my work. Uh, it uh, gave me the freedom to push the edges paintings. After my training in New York, I was ready for a change and relocated to Western Massachusetts, drawn by its beauty and tranquility. My husband and I um, found a handyman special in the Berkshires, which all, over the course of several years, we renovated. Uh, this home became the inspiration for houseworks. Uh, the carpenter who renovated our house, this wonderful uh, Yankee carpenter called Al Hood, um, he um, built these houses for me from the leftover wood from the house we renovated. Um, and anyway, so over the years while doing these house paintings, um, which I call houseworks, uh, because I wanted to push the uh, what women do. Uh, women are so connected to the house. We've been the keeper of the hearth, raise our children, cook, clean. But also, I wanted to honor that work and also the women who were who were creative, even with all the things that we were juggling in our life. So these house paintings have gone from being my personal history to universal themes from about the community, spirituality, and the role of women in our society. Um, I have also uh, been a curator along this time. And um, because I wanted to help promote um, local artists uh, and when the economic crash happened, um, several galleries in Amherst closed and um, I was running the Public Arts Commission and I thought, why not do a biennial, you know? Um, and I found places in uh, the community, uh, empty storefronts and um, decommissioned school, a new park, and um, I had art all over the place. And in fact, I, uh, the, one of the things that was astonishing to me was that there were no contemporary sculptures in Amherst. And 
we have three colleges that all have art programs and to not have contemporary art was just, I couldn't believe it. So uh, in the first biennial, we planted, installed a piece uh, called The Portal by uh, Mark Johnson. And um, I worked with the DPW and uh, they poured a foundation and um, I thought, well, you know, maybe we should make this permanent. And so um, I was able to raise funds to make it a permanent installation. And subsequently, uh, there have been many uh, sculpture shows um, in the park because of that. Um, I will talk a bit about my work. Um, these houses, I feel, show um, the how much um, the house means to me as a woman and um, a mother. Uh, one of the pieces is called Nesting, and this is really about me, my husband, and our son. Um, the um, And also I play with uh, the images of the Statue of Liberty because I feel that she represents the best of what our country is, welcoming immigrants. Uh, anyway, uh, I am a, a woman of uh, few words and I feel that um, I'd like to say some of the poetry of Adrian Rich that speaks to me. I choose to love this time for once with all my intelligence. Silence can be a plan rigorously executed, the blueprint to a life. It is a presence, it's a history, a form. Do not confuse it with any kind of absence. I'd like to dedicate this uh, to my husband who is a man of few words. Anyway, the dream of a common language. Thank you, Adrian Rich. such a pleasure to introduce Lynn. You know, we've never met, have we? I feel like we have, but um, Lynn's, Lynn's work and her person was the first conversation for this show for me. When I found her work, it all just, first, I didn't know what to do with it. And then it just all came together from there, the more I dug in. So I so appreciate your expression. I'm just going to, I'm going to do a bio because it's important. Um, Lynn Allen's work has been exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally, as, and is included in the collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art Library, the New York Public Library, New York, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, Library of Congress, Washington, D.C., the Springfield Art Museum, Missouri, the Minneapolis Museum of Art, the Vesteros Kunst Museum in Sweden, and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, as well as in numerous corporate collections. <clears throat> From her statement, her art making is a love affair with the forsaken. Love that. Taking center stage, her subjects are those whom history would rather leave out. Animals that have become extinct, native traditions, the homeless, prisoners, and myths about how the West was won. Her work aims to tell the stories of animals, the unloved, and victims of injustice. The matriarchs in her family have all been members of the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Ellen can trace her native heritage back six generations to Wastwin, the good women, in the early 1800s. Ellen questions the history as it has been written by the victors. She seeks the voices of those who were left out with the goal of creating a space where the viewer has a chance to imagine a world other than their own. So we have 
works from her native works collection here on the front wall. These are from her extinction series, which continues into the sitting gallery back there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drive a million miles to be with us tonight, Lynn Allen. <laughs> I usually don't have any trouble projecting, so I'm not so sure. Oh, okay, yes. Hello, Zoom. Close, to the mic. close, uh, close enough? As close as you're comfortable. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be um, part of this exhibit. I'm enamored with the work that I've seen in a little bit of time that I've actually been here, and I apologize for being late. I left at quarter to five from Boston and it took me this long. It was ridiculous. Yes. Um, but I'm happy to be here. I, I, just, I was looking around for where I knew I would see a face that I knew here. Um, I prepared nothing and sh she read the statement. I don't need to say anything else because it was beautifully written. And I don't know who wrote that or when I wrote that, but uh, it says it all right there. Uh, but to give a little bit of background, I've, uh, been a printmaker since I was an undergraduate, which was 100 years ago, as my daughter says, I'm older than dirt. Um, and uh, as an undergrad, I was a printmaker. I lived in Europe seven years. I I became a master printer, uh, where I printed for wonderful artists like Ed Boucher and some other you know, famous people, which was really wonderful. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough, um, I got my master of fine arts in painting but I haven't painted since. Uh, I've been a printmaker. What can I tell you? I just, uh, I'm a printmaker and I know all of the techniques inside out. So it's never an issue about what I'm going to make and how I'm going to make it. It's the idea behind it. What, what, what is the focus? What, what is it that I need to say that I need to get out of my system? Uh, and it has been the same since I was an undergrad. I realized that my work has not changed one iota. It's all about the marginalized. It's all about the misunderstood. Maybe I felt misunderstood, which probably is true, considering I have two older brothers. Uh, nobody listened to me. Uh, I was always the one that was, you know, wrong. <laughs> uh, I don't know where it came from, but uh, uh, but actually I do. I, I'm being disingenuous. So my, it's true. My, uh, my, all the fam all the matriarchs of my family uh, uh, are Hunpapa Lakota Sioux, uh, all the way back those generations that I said. Uh, and my mother grew up on the Standing Rock Indi Indian Reservation, um, born there. And then in the um, I think eighth or ninth grade, when the 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 two room school finished, that's all you did. That's all where you went. Her family uh, sent her to the East Coast and she boarded, basically she boarded with a family, not even not even a relative. So it's kind of like boarding school because my grandmother went to the Carlisle Indian Institute in Pennsylvania. My great grandmother went to the Hampton Institute in Virginia, which was a school for freed black slaves. They were all sent to, to, to be re-educated, realigned, education, religion, language, everything. So, but what's interesting about this is you hear all these horror stories when there are tons of horror stories about about the educational system the boarding school system really bad bad situations but for some reason those spunky women in my family took the best parts of it and then did something with it uh, my great grandmother went back to the reservations she started she started writing letters for sitting bull to washington uh, she started to interview all the chiefs that were at the battle of the little bighorn this book was published finally. It took four generations in 2013. It's called Witness. Uh, I wrote the foreword. I got a foundation to get money so we could put all these photographs in it. I mean, it just basically took four generations because it never got published during her lifetime. So anyway, so uh, my grandmother went to Carlisle and, you know, they teach you how to be a seamstress. She was excellent as a seamstress. And, uh, uh, she also, they did these, which this is really kind of interesting. They do these um, things in the summer where they sent you off to be like a domestic somewhere. And she was sent to the Berkshires, which I think now is like, wow, you know, I mean, <laughs> and then I ended up in Boston. I mean, it's kind of amazing. So my mother went East in her own sort of boarding school situation, lived with a family that wasn't even a relative and finished high school in Pennsylvania, went on to college, got a scholarship, met my father. And the rest is history. So this, I'm from Pennsylvania. I never grew up on the reservation. I never felt, even though 
my mother, you have to tell me when my 10 minutes is up because this could go on forever. I mean, <laughs> um, my mother never belonged in either world uh, because she's not 100% native. Um, and so she never really felt she belonged in the, in the, in the native world because she moved away and she never felt like she belonged in the white world because she was so different. I mean, she rode at horses school, really. She learned to swim in a, in a horse trough, in a trough for water. I mean, just all these stories. And she pined for the prairie her whole entire life. She used to talk about it, the smell and the tumbleweed. And I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I grew up around pine needles and, and pine trees in the forest but my mother, being the oldest of four, um, um, because of the Dawes Act, when they were giving away acreage to uh, Native Americans to try to make them farmers, uh, she received 160 acres of, of uh, tribal land on the Standing Rock Reserva Reservation in South Dakota. So the Standing Rock is, is in North and South Dakota. The, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is in Fort Yates, which is in North Dakota, but we're from the South Dakota side down where, and we're part of uh, Sitting Bulls Hunkpapa tribe. So he, he, in fact, my great great grandmother went to Canada with Sitting Bull and then came back when ca the Canadians wouldn't give him any land. So anyway, back to the 160 acres. I got the 160 acres when my mother died. Never been there. I've been, I've been back there. I, my, I went with my grandmother. I've been back to South Dakota, but I was never. I was, I never didn't grow up on the rest and, and everything I learned about my culture was from my mother's memories and my great grand and my grandmother's memories. So I go back, to, I go there after my mother died to go to Fort Gates to get it all figured out that the land's now mine and blah, blah, blah. And I met this wonderful farmer and it was July and he took me to the land in his truck because my car was too low to the ground. I could start a fire. So he took me in his truck and I opened the car door and the smell I burst into tears. I said, this, I mean, I, I could start crying right now. This is what she was talking about. It was just, so anyway, I never made work about my native heritage ever. Cause I, I felt like kind of like a sham. Like I'm, I'm a white girl, uh, you know? And uh, until I was, I, I before I, I'm, I teach at Boston University. And before that I was at Rutgers University in New Jersey uh, for a long time. And we did this one, we had a professional print shop house within the printmaking department of which I was director. And we had uh, 10 um, native artists come and work and make prints with us. And one of them, uh, Melanie Yazzie from the DNA Navajo Nation, we went out to lunch and you know, I just started to tell her a little bit. And she said, Lynn, you have to come out of the closet. She said, it's not, it's not, it's what's in here, you know, and everything. So I was like 50 years old at the time. And I thought, okay, if Melanie says it's okay, it's okay. And so all this stuff, well, also at the same time. So the, the manuscripts that my great grandmother wrote, she tried to get them published. There's bits and pieces all over the country in the North Dakota Historical Society. There's some stuff at the University of Nebraska. Just she tried to make a dime and try to get somebody to, to, to publish it, and they never did. In fact, she got ripped off right and left, obviously, as a woman, as a minority, and lo and behold, a Native American, even worse. Um, and so she had boxes of her stuff, of her handwritten stuff. And when she died, she gave it to my grandmother. And my grandmother, being on Indian time, did nothing with it. And then when she died, she gave it to my aunt because my mother had already passed on. And so she would have given it to my mother because my mother was the oldest and probably the most native of them all. I mean, uh, and so it went to my it went to my aunt. And she did nothing with it either. She sent it to a cousin in Bismarck, North Dakota. And I had a solo exhibition at, at the Plains Art Museum in Fargo. And I thought, let's let's go out and see Cousin Jan. And we drove out and she threw those three boxes, boxes in the back of my car. And so I got the boxes. That's the fourth generation right there. I got the boxes. I contacted an, an editor who knew about her writing before. We got together. We got money. We got University of Nebraska to publish it. And she had 10, I, I recopy, I copyrighted it so that nobody could steal any of this stuff because it's, she is, she had personal histories of, of, from chiefs that were at the bat of a little bighorn. I mean, it was, it's full of information that has never been published anywhere. So uh, I got it, I got it uh, copyrighted. And then um, she, she had, we had 10 years before it was 75 years after the death of my great grandmother. We had 10 years. So that was 2013. And so fortunately in 2013, 
um, she was ready and she wrote to me and she, she called me up and she said, Lynn, you got to write the forward. You got to write the forward. And I kept saying, what am I going to, how am I going to write a forward for my whole heritage, my whole, all those cousins, all those people that don't even know we're really doing this. I mean, I felt like, why? I felt kind of weird. And so in 20 minutes sitting at my desk at BU, I wrote this thing, just exactly how I felt. And she changed one word. And that one word, I don't remember, but I know that it was a dig about um, how the Indians were treated. I mean, it was it was a dig, and she sort of smoothed that over a little bit. Uh, but uh, but anyway, <laughs> we published the book. It was really really great, and because I had all that material, it just it 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 just made all this stuff happen. I mean, I've read something, and there'd be a line like they were as numerous as grass that print over there where she's talking about the buffalo. There's so many buffalo. They were as numerous as grass. How poetic is that? They were as numerous as grass. I mean, I've made these quilts that I would have given you if they weren't in Wisconsin out of packing blankets because when the natives went to the boarding school, my grandmother told me that some couldn't couldn't stay. They just, they, they couldn't assimilate. And so they left and they went back to the reservation and they didn't assimilate into both cultures. They went back to the blanket. So when I moved to Boston with all those packing blankets of moving a household and a studio, the studio was four fifth of the, of the tractor trailer. Um, I started embroidering on these packing blankets. I'm going back to the blanket and I started to, I, I've only made two, I'm starting a third one, but sort of the history of what happened when the ships came and then what happened when the forts were built. And then what happens when they try to make them farmers? You know, I mean, all this kind of stuff. So it was just been a wealth of information for me. And and so you also, I'm, I'm going to stop soon. So you also talk about the endangered species stuff. It, it's all connected. Uh, it's all under our control, how we treat people, how we treat our environment, how we uh, acknowledge the fact that um, we are ruining the environment, uh, that we are... Uh, disingenuous with people that history is rewritten. Um, I've read so much stuff that is just um, incorrect. Uh, and so part of me is, I mean, it's all connected. So I make endangered species, I make climate change, I make a little, some of this native stuff that comes out of, out of, out of my own heritage. And that's what I do. I mean, that, and, and it's exactly the same, the same. I, I taught a class once at Anderson Ranch in Colorado with a group of, of um, emerged artists. They, they weren't novices, they were, they were artists in their own right. And we had like a three week thing and we critiqued and we looked at stuff. And at the very, very end, I told them to write one word on the back of a card that said what their work was about and to pin it to the wall. And then when we talked about their work, we tried to imagine what that word was. And my word is empathy. Thank you very much. <laughs> The three artists who are eager to talk to you will raise the chairs and break the bottles open. That <laughs> 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 It was, a little, it was a little tricky. It was a little tricky, though, because I have to fly out of a different airport to fly to the island to attend and to pronounce. Obviously, and then I have to get on the train and I have to train and I have to get the passenger because it's in a different So, I mean, that'll be really interesting. I'll let you know. <laughs> 
I don't even have any yen money because I wasn't smart enough to go to the bank and get some money because it comes out of the ATM machine. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, I'm sure what I've done stuck. Thank you, Zoomers. The session is over. Thank you.